All right, we're, we're okay. Calvin. Calvin. Calvin, mm. Calvin Castine, there we go. Right. I just got it going, we're going right now. Calvin Castine at Olympic Stadium for Hometown Cable, continuing with our behind the scenes look in and around the Expos. And today we're gonna be talking to a, a visitor and to the people in the uh, North Country, the north, northern part of uh, Clinton County. He's not a, an unfamiliar face by any means, although it's been a few years since you were a regular in our vicinity. Mr. Tom Cheek. Face made for radio, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wouldn't recognize me because I was on radio for all of those years. We're going to go back and we're going to bring you up to date on the, uh, the Tom Cheek story. Tom has uh, been the Blue Jays play-by-play uh, -play man right from day one, I believe. Is that correct? From day one, yeah. 26 seasons now. It's hard to believe, but the background and the opportunity came from the experiences in the business back up in New York State and over in Vermont, and then the very fact that I was able to break into baseball here in Montreal with the Expos has always been kind of a, a, an attachment for me, if you will. And I'm a little bit filled with melancholy as the Blue Jays come to town here to play this series because they tell us this might be the last time that we come here uh, as a ball team to play the Expos. Now, I'm hard-headed enough uh, not to believe the contraction thing. They're going to have to show me that. But I believe that if there are Expos in the future, they might be in another locale and the uniform might be a little bit different. So for those reasons, because this is where my great opportunity began, I find this weekend a little bit bittersweet. Yeah, it's, a, it's a kind of a almost a sure bet that there won't be a, a 2003 season here in Montreal, but you never know. That's there's a lot of ball games where the uh, the team that couldn't uh, lose ended up losing, and uh, who knows what might happen in the future. Well, that's very true, and I got some good news when I got to the ballpark here today. I hear that there's a group in the city that is uh, forming up to buy the ball club. Now, this is pretty ambitious. I think we all understand that. And they're talking about building a small, like a 35,000-seat ballpark. And I know that this has been talked about before, but I'm told by some of my colleagues here in Montreal that it's serious talk now and that uh, they could uh, very well pull this off. If not, there's another school of thought. Let's say that Virginia gets the ball team, Northern Virginia, which I believe would be a very viable market. Uh, but they would not be ready to play for a year or two. And my spin on that has always been, well, you go to RFK in Washington until the new park is ready. But now I understand that the talk is that should an entity from Northern Virginia come into the picture to buy the team, they would remain here, which would mean another season until they built a ballpark in Virginia. All of this is hearsay. Nobody knows anything for certain except we have a ball game tonight. It uh, is a saying that originated with that great baseball philosopher, Yogi Berra. It ain't over till it's over, right, Tom? That's exactly right, and we have have all had lessons about that in our life. So until they uh, actually back up the trucks and move out of here, I refuse to believe that it's going to happen and that somebody somehow is not going to step in, in the, until maybe the 11th hour to save it. A lot of what we're hearing about contraction and uh, a lot of the other uh, bad news that's being churned out right now is uh, posturing for negotiations between the owners and the players. So some of it you take with a grain of salt. Yes. And uh, Minnesota ain't going nowhere, as they say. Minnesota's staying put, so if contraction happens, it's going to have to be another team besides Minnesota as the second team. Well, you know, even the Blue Jays have been mentioned in that regard, and uh, I hate to see see that <laughs> as a possibility, but anything, I guess, is is possible at this uh, this stage. But oh, yeah, and they've looked at four, six teams, they yeah. say, and they're, they're throwing all kinds of figures out there, but again, you don't know how much of that is real and how much of it is negotiation. An interesting point that you make right there, because when the club was in New York a few uh, weeks ago, uh, I, along with other members of our media, uh, was summoned up to the commissioner's office to have lunch with uh, Mr. Dupay, the new uh, um, president of uh, Major League Baseball, who replaced Paul Beeston. Kind of like uh, having lunch with Andy Rooney, by the way. I really like the guy. But you have to remember a couple of things. One, he's an attorney, and two, he's Bud Selig's attorney. So, you know, you take that with a large grain of salt. But he did make a point that uh, kind of chilled me to the bone, and he said what a lot of people don't understand is that 
the majority of the owners would like to see six teams eliminated so they could cut their little pie 24 ways and not 30 ways, but that the commissioner is dedicated to two-team contraction. So fact from fiction, who really knows, but uh, somehow I just hope that they're going to get their heads together, get a deal, because I truly do not believe that this game could stand another strike like 1994. No, following 94, uh it came back, but uh, I think it took Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa in 98 and the, the, the big season that the Yankees had that year. And uh, I think that as much as anything brought baseball back. Well, I, I agree with that, but I think now the people have seen that. Mm -hmm. And the people have seen the price of a ticket escalate beyond their means. And the... Uh, the salaries go up in this thing to where they make no rhyme or reason or sense. And you have to ask your quest yourself the question, what's there to strike about? I mean, what can you possibly have as an issue between the two sides? So, again, uh, we'll just have to kind of play it out because this is like a Disney movie. You've got the two stags butting heads in the uh, moonlight, and we're all sitting on stumps, the little animals <laughs> just kind of taking it all in. Well, Rex Allen narrated a lot of those, and your, your voice sounds a little bit like Rex Allen, that nice, deep, resonant voice. Well, you're going way back now, Rex <laughs> Allen, holy cow. You talked about Disney movies. and uh, Let's go back a little bit into the Tom Cheek story. I first heard the name Tom Cheek when I was probably about 7th or 8th grade, uh, going to town team basketball games. And there was a guy named Tom Cheek and a guy named Gene Myler and a lot of local guys like uh, Henry Gooley and uh, Dale Trombley and Leo Richard and others are playing town team ball. And Henry Gooley had one of the weirdest jump shots. He looked like a frog leaping, but boy, he could stick it. Huh? He was a great guy to play with. That, those, that was really a wonderful time. And uh, we took the old Nitsy Profs on one time over there. Bob in the, Garrow. Yeah, and, and, and beat them. That was a great night because not too often did that happen back then. But uh, those, were, uh, those were great days. And as we were saying before, a lot of uh, my family history is right there in Champlain and over in Hemingford, Quebec, where my wife Shirley uh, came from, and Ethel Valak, uh, married to my brother-in-law Vic, right there in Champlain. So, yeah, we, we are really uh, connected with that part of the world. Uh, you came to Champlain, I, I believe, as a construction worker on the Northway. Is that, that correct? Well, I got out of the service, and uh, I knew that I wanted to be in the broadcasting business, but uh, at that time, a guy from uh, the Piney Woods of northern Florida I would say things like the president and stuff like this and there wasn't a great call for that in, in the north country so uh, I knocked on a lot of doors and I had to keep body and soul together uh, while I was trying to figure out how I was going to get into this broadcasting thing which I knew I wanted to do since I was very very young so if you take a ride down the north way uh, and you switch lanes Remember me, I'm the guy that put the redheads for miles and miles down that sucker as they were building that. And then uh, moved over to the missile silos that they were ringing Plattsburgh with in those days. Actually ended up a nighttime uh, engineer. You're looking at a guy who had to take two runs at algebra just to get out of high school. If they ever tried to fire a missile out of one of those silos, they'd probably knock Montreal off the map. Moscow didn't have anything to uh, worry about. You're scaring our cameraman, Norm Model. He lives on the Missile Base Road in Champlain. Well, so. they're, they're obsolete. And that, the, <laughs> the greatest day of my life was I read in the paper the Atlas missile was obsolete before they ever got them in the holes here. So that was good news for everybody because I was responsible for one of those places. <laughs> so your, your first radio job after you were done uh, destroying the missile bases? Or? Coming down the mountain one night in Sugarbush and uh, listening to Bruce Bradley on WBZ, and he was doing a commercial for a thing called the uh, uh, Cambridge School of Broadcasting. And he was, he was asking, you know, an open question. Would you like to be a broadcaster? Yes. Would you like to be a sportscaster? Yes. Would you like to do this, that, and the other thing? Yes, yes, yes. Well, call this number, which I did the next day. I figured I better get off this missile thing before. As a matter of fact, some of the guys were talking about building a tunnel under the Long Island Sound. And I kind of started, you know, tuning into this. And then I said, what are you talking about? You haven't fallen into this hole yet. You're sure as hell not going under the Long Island Sound. You better get a grip. So coming down the mountain, I heard that discussion and uh, contacted the Cambridge School of Broadcasting in Boston and learned not to say the president and a few other things. And uh, that's, that's how it happened. And uh, the uh, first job opportunity was right there in Plattsburgh, WEAV. And you weren't there 
very long, were you, before you went to Vermont? No, no, I was there uh, just a short while. Uh, I did a split shift. I would uh, be on the air from 9 in the morning until noon, and then not until 3 until 6. So from noon until 3, I'd go down the Saranac River behind the radio station and try to catch a fish. It was great. Have a sandwich and, uh, and fish. And one day, Mr. Bissell, who owned the place, came in with a cigar, and he said, hey, sounding real good, sounding real good. You're taping yourself? I said, yes, sir, Mr. Bissell. We're sounding real good. And at 6 o'clock when I got off the ship that day, the program director was waiting outside. He said, hate to tell you this, he said, but Mr. Bissell said we have to let you go. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that I replaced, who had been there forever and a day, decided he wanted to come home. He wanted the job back, and uh, I was the odd man out. <laughs> but that was a big break because I ended up over in... Uh, uh, Burlington, Vermont, at a wonderful time back there in 62, and it was uh, just great to, to be a part of that, roll up your sleeves, uh, go to work. That city was like a, a, you know, sleeping at the side of the, the lake and just ready to stretch and yawn, and uh, a lot of nice things happened to us professionally and in a family context. All three of our children were born there, so uh, again, that, that North Country connection, it's, it's very real in our lives. Now, you uh, married a girl from Hemingford. Uh, can I ask where you met her? I met her in Plattsburgh, New York. I, she, I always kid her. I said, you heard about this, this uh, big guy down there in, in Plattsburgh. You came down to, to check it out. Uh, no, it really didn't work that way. But uh, no, uh, I, but I did. I met her in um, one of the clubs down there. And we uh, struck up a relationship and decided to get hitched. And 43 years later, here we are. OK. I like to pick up on this, Tom, but I know you've got a press conference that you want to go to. Your but now you're making me sound too important. Our manager is having a press scrum, as we call it in the media. So we're going to go over and find out what he thinks about this series opening up with the uh, Expos here okay. tonight. Can we chat with you after that? Absolutely. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. We have moved up now to the visitor's press box where the play-by-play uh, -play will be taking place in the tonight's game. This is where all the visiting teams uh, find themselves when they come here, all the visiting play-by-play uh, -play announcers, radio men. And we're going to impose on uh, Tom Cheek to uh, probably pick up a little bit on the story before we get into uh, what happens up here. We're going to pick up a little bit on the story and how he went from Vermont to Toronto. Now, it doesn't just happen automatically. Uh, you must have... Uh, I know I talked to you back, I think, in 86, and you told us a little bit about that story back then. Now, you, you've done some work up here in Montreal and so on, so tr fill us in on that. Well, it was the advent of baseball here in the city of Montreal that uh, gave me the opportunity when the Expos came into being back in 69. In the very beginning, they had a very limited uh, television schedule, and therefore they did not want to hire a lot of bodies. So what would happen would be that when they would televise, Dave Van Horn, who was their number one radio guy, would put on the CBC jacket, move up to the TV booth, and their hitting coach at that time was Duke Snyder. He would come out of uniform and go work with Dave and uh, do the telecast. Well, obviously, this created a vacancy on the radio side when Dave wasn't there, and the late Russ Taylor was his sidekick. And uh, the original premise was they were going to have a announcer of the week kind of thing whenever they televised. I came up, I was the second guy that they asked to do this. The first was a fellow from Toronto, a good friend of mine named Ron Hewitt. And uh, Ron did the very first one of those. I did the second. And then they called me back again, and they called me back again, and again, and again. And uh, there was a, a gentleman at that time uh, who was doing the hiring for this, and he said to me, he said, you can figure out what's happening here. Uh, when we have a television game, you can anticipate we would like to have you come do the game. But we cannot make any kind of a commitment to you. Certainly, we can't put anything in writing because you are an American and you're coming up here and you're taking somebody's job. Just that cut and dried. I was moonlighting for all intents and purposes. But I was also, when I knew that there would be a Wednesday night game to do, I was making the run from Burlington, Vermont to the ballpark uh, Jerry Park at that time on the other side of the island 100 miles up and 100 miles back whether I was working or not I would sit in a, a TV booth with a tape recorder 
and I would broadcast into the tape recorder, and then I would, uh, I had to eventually uh, self-impose a curfew on myself. I said, whatever's happening down on the field at 11 o'clock, I have to leave because I don't want to fall asleep on the way back. You know, it's pretty lonely highways back in those days, and I would put the tape recorder on the car seat beside me and listen to myself and bang on the horn or the steering wheel and say, why did you say that? We well, you know you're, you're in a rut, you're doing this, you're doing that. What I was doing was trying to be as well prepared as I possibly could when the Wednesday game would come around. And I think that kind of stood me in good stead. I also met a lot of the other broadcasters, got a couple of tips along the way from some people that I, I really respected. And that led to a gentleman by the name of Len Bramson, who used to sell the advertising on the Expos. He went to Toronto ahead of baseball coming there and made a deal with the legendary voice of hockey at that time, uh, Foster Hewitt, who owned a radio station. They formed a partnership to get the broadcast rights. Lynn knew of my work with the Expos, and he came up to me at an Expos party one night, and he said, baseball's coming to Toronto. I enjoy the way you do things, and uh, we'd like to have you be a part of it if you're interested. No guarantees. That's how it all happened. And uh, you were interested, I take it? I, you know, I was interested, but this was my dream. This was what I had in mind when I was a little motormouth kid playing stickball in front of my house at 141 J Street in Pensacola, Florida, those many years ago. But at the time that this job did finally come along, I was 36, we had three children, I was deeply entrenched in the community in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, there was a good chance that the person that I was working with, when he retired, I would kind of inherit his stake in the little radio domain that we had built, <coughs> built over there, excuse me, from one station to three stations. I was very involved with the Medical Center of Vermont. I was very involved with the Lake Champlain Regional Chamber of Commerce. So it wasn't exactly cut and dried. At this time now, I had to stop and say, hey, wait a second, are you doing the right thing here? What about the family? And this is going to sound really corny to you, but as God is my witness, I actually was shaving one day, looking at myself in the mirror, and I said, you know what? If you don't do this, don't ever complain or tell anybody that you can do this again because, you know, if you don't take the shot now, this might never come your way again. This is your one time to grab the brass ring, so I grabbed. Well, there was a little bit of a fear of success there, too, a fear of, fear of failure probably on, for hesitating a little bit, too, I imagine. Remember this. It was the city of Toronto, full of high-rises and skyscrapers. Vermont had one escalator in it at this time, so I felt a little bit like a, a fish out of water. How am I going to be uh, received? I didn't come with great baseball credentials, obviously. It always amazed me that Peter Bavese, who was the first president of the ball team, actually let them hire me. I figured he'd bring in some of his L.A. guys or something and, you know, somebody with a, a big reputation. But Len Bramson stood firm. He's my mentor. He's a father figure to me in many regards. And he's retired today, but he's still in good health, and we see a lot of one another. So I really do owe everything to him. And to Russ Taylor. I was in Anaheim some years ago, and I got a call from this Mr. Bramson to inform me that Russ Taylor had a heart attack and died. It was after and a, quite a few years after the fact that I found out that the reason I kept being called back up here to do those games was Russ Taylor was kind of a nervous Nelly guy. He didn't like the idea of working with somebody different all the time. And he said, this, this guy, Tom Cheek, he, he enjoys it. He's prepared. He wants it. So they kind of settled on me because of Russ. One of my great regrets in life, and we all have them, was that I was never able to shake his hand and say, thanks, Russ. He passed away before I really heard that side of the story. That's, uh, that's, you know, it's nice that you've at least found out about it and you can you know, uh, know about it now. Now, you've worked with some pretty interesting people over the year. I know uh, for several years we were with the Hall of Famer, Early Win. Well, my first partner was Early, uh, Gus, as he was called in the game, the last of uh, a breed, and uh, 
I learned a lot, a lot of stuff from early. Uh, some of it I'm not so sure was in my best interest. He showed me another side of this game and he could run pretty hard, but I stayed with him. I kept up my end of the bargain. And when it happened down between the white lines, there was nothing that he had not seen before in the game. So he was not the world's best broadcaster by any stretch of the imagination. But when it was time to tell a story or to relate to something that had happened in the past or take your mind off what was going on on the field with those expansion Blue Jays at that time, he was wonderful. And uh, Early's gone now. He passed away a few years ago, but we were great friends from one day in spring training in 1977 until the end. I was there at the end, so uh, it was kind of a rite of passage, I guess, that uh, uh, Early took me under his wing and uh, got me ready for life in the game after him. But I had a great, great run with him. I like the players, you you pack up your bags after every series and are are on the road and that might be fun for the first few years when you're young and enthusiastic, but you've been doing this for 26 seasons. Uh, does it get a little tiring once in a while to know you're going to have to pack up in three days and hit the road again? Well, I don't have to worry about, you know, somebody sticking a baseball in my ear or a runner coming in and taking me out and destroying my knee or something like that. All I have to do is talk about it. So, I, yes, it's, uh, it, it's not quite like these guys, but we all are kind of in the same boat in as much as the travel part of it. If you do not travel well, you cannot do this job. And there are some times when you're just kind of working on adrenaline or you're in a, in a little state of uh, almost like a neutral while you're trying to catch your breath. It's not a physical tiredness, it's kind of a mental tiredness. And there have been many days in the past when I'd be sitting on the team bus outside a hotel someplace and you'd see the proverbial family of four go by in the station wagon and maybe a dog's ears in the window or an umbrella sticking out the back and you know that they were headed out in the uh, in the station wagon to the beach and you'd say to yourself, you know, that's what sane people do. I kind of like to do that. But then when you get to the ballpark and you get around these guys and you get into the environment, and you know what? It, it, it's self-policing. It kind of takes care of itself. The juices begin to flow again and, and it, it's, it's great. And the thing about this game, you will never live long enough to see it all. You think really that you have seen just about, as I mentioned early before, everything that can happen. You really don't because uh, the ball can take some funny bounces and as one of our players Garth Orge told me many years ago you put the uniform on enough you'll look stupid happens to everybody and learning to deal with failure is the success of a baseball player remember three out of ten will get you into the Hall of Fame in this game so as Reggie Jackson once said yeah he hit all those home runs but nobody talks about all those strikeouts. And that says it for everybody in the game. Okay, I know you've got to get ready for the game. Just fill us in a little bit now, Tom, about what you do to prepare. Well, Yogi Berra once called the catcher's gear the tools of ignorance, or somebody did, you know, which was, by the way, uh, not a very fair thing to say because catchers are maybe not the best athletes, but they're the best baseball minds back there. They see the game from another perspective. And if you would like proof of that, Take a look at uh, the managerial ranks today, how many ex-catchers there are out there. This is a scorebook. This just uh, its my own little scorebook, my own little creation. Uh, Jack Buck, the great broadcaster with the St. Louis Cardinals many years ago, gave me a, a page out of his when I was at Jerry Park doing those games. I refined it a little bit to fit my own style, if you will. So. I can dig this out in the winter time and watch the embers die in the fire and go back to a game and in my memory and uh, kind of replay it. Now people give us too much credit for what we know. What they do not understand is it's kind of a paper war that we fight here. This is what the mechanism from the public relations end of the game uh, gives to us every day for every team. I can tell you what, uh, what a particular team does in a day game, a night game, AstroTurf, outdoors, uh, blah, 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 blah. It's all here. All the little stories and everything about the different players, their statistics and everything, it's all right here. So I tip my cap to the old guys who came along 
before press guides came along many years ago. These things did not happen until sometime in the 50s, but there's everything that you want to know about an individual right there, all prepared for you. Now, what we have to do to prepare... They get thicker every year, too, those media guides. They get thicker every year, but what we have to do is, this is like, almost like a soap opera, and there's a different episode every day. So, those are the numbers, those are the bare facts, but there are stories behind the stories, and that's what kind of hanging out, you know, will give you. It all starts in the morning reading the newspapers, reading the box scores, and now that we're in the computer age, surfing the net and reading up on maybe the next opponent or reading the perspective on this game in the Toronto papers or if they're in our place, whatever city they're from. So you've really got it covered just about any way you can imagine today. But there are times why in the minds of people, you wonder, why did he do what he did, you know? I mean, he's better than that, or why didn't he show up in that situation? Why wasn't he there? So that's what you get from being around the batting cage, talking to these guys uh, in the clubhouse, uh, sitting in the dugout, chatting with them, chatting with the manager, the little stories behind the stories, because the PR departments cannot tell you everything. There's the human side of this. And I've often said that, you know, we, this is not a black and white thing. Uh, for every action, there's a reaction, sure. But everything that happens out there just can't necessarily be explained. Uh, two and two does not always equal four in this game. Sometimes it equals five. And I, I relate it to what I like to call headaches, hangovers, hangnails and fights with your wife. These guys are, are not in the best frame of mind every day to play this game, but there's 162 of them. They have to go out and play the game. So every day, they're not going to be clicking. They're human beings. So that's the side of the story that we sometimes can't even tell, but we know so you know how to approach it on this end on the broadcast. Some things we're made privy to some things we're not you have to kind of ferret it out for yourself and if you want to really be up to snuff on what we're doing here you have to do your own homework that's the bottom line on what I'm trying to say here in about a zillion words so you're saying you don't just work three hours a day what how many hours would you put in a day 10 12 well as I said before now uh, sitting in a nice uh, hotel we five-star hotels in the dining room having a nice breakfast reading the paper is believe it or not work because I'm taking notes and sometimes tearing little things out and uh, it starts there I would go back to my room or in the context of a home game the apartment I'll spend a certain amount of time on the computer every day maybe an hour or so and then uh, for a uh, seven o'clock ball game I'm in the ballpark any place from four o'clock on so uh, it's uh, then you've got the three, four hours of the ball game. So, you know, when it's all said and done, you put in a good eight, nine, ten hour day. Yes. OK. And there's no let up during the you get an off day. You're, you're looking forward to it, I'm sure. Well, they're few and far between under the rules of the association. We cannot play more than 19 days in a row. And then they have to get sometimes certain circumstances will di dictate that they do. But that's got to be passed through the players. Uh, organization and be okayed and everything else so uh, off days are few and far between and very very precious and very rarely are they off days when you're having a home stand usually have an off day when you're ready to head out to the day later to the, another city well quite often we're actually traveling on the off day right. the ideal is to play go to the next city and be in position so you get a good night's sleep or at least uh, you know you're there but uh, too often now the economics of the game being what they are, we travel on off days, so you really don't even get the entire day off. Okay, anything else, Tom, that uh, you think uh, would be of interest to our viewers? No, just uh, ask Henry Gooley if he's still working on that jump shot and tell everybody back home I said hello. Okay. Thank you. And where did, where did you live when you lived in, when you were in Champlain? Where did you live? Yeah, we lived in a couple of places. Danny Marr's place up on uh, Oak Street was the, uh, the first place, and... Uh, uh, we ended up, uh, can't think of the lady's name now, uh, they passed away long ago, but uh, big house that uh, was right beside at that time the old railroad track, uh, can't think of the name, but anyway.
a couple of addresses there in Champlain. All right. I wish you continued success. Uh, much longer are you going to stick with this, you think? A few more years? Well, I, have, I don't really even think in those terms. One day, somebody's going to tap me on the back and say, old man, it's time to go. And when that happens, and we'll pick up our little playthings and just kind of fade off as, you know, like old soldiers. I guess old broadcasters just fade away. Well, it, it might even be the guy in the mirror who taps you on the shoulder and says that. Could be. Okay, thanks for talking with us, Tom. Tom. We go to the home half of the sixth inning. Jose Vigro, Vladimir Guerrero, and Troy O'Leary coming up for the Expos. Our game tonight brought to you by Rogers Digital Cable. Between the innings here, Carlos Tosca had to come out and get between the plate umpire Jim Reynolds and Eric Hinsky, the third baseman. Reynolds had gone all the way over near third base. And then Carlos Delgado came from the other side of the infield and he had some words. So we're not exactly sure what's going on here, but there's some consternation from the Blue Jays toward the umpire something that was or was not called first pitch misses ball one to Pedro and now the pitch is away ball two from the right hander Corey Thurman Justin Miller started with the first four and a third gave up eight hits and six runs with a career high six walks ground ball down behind first nice play Delgado feed Thurman for the out and there's one down here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Nicely done by Delgado. He had to get all the way over to the line to cut that ball off, and it was a shot on the Astroturf. Put out goes 3 1. And here comes that man, Guerrero. Vladimir tonight has walked, struck out, and hit into a double play. He'll take a breaking ball, and it finishes high, ball one. The Expos six runs on ten hits, no errors. The Blue Jays two runs, six hits, and no errors. Game one of a three-game weekend series. There's a swing and a base hit in the left field. That's cut off by Stewart. That's a solid single for Vladimir Guerrero. And the 11th hit for the Expos here this evening. Tomorrow night, Esteban Loaiza, three and two with a 4.71 ERA, goes to the hill against right-hander Carl Pavano, who's three and eight with a 5.99. And then on Sunday, the Blue Jays will have Steve Paris ready to go against Vasquez for the other side in the finale, which will be a 1:35 Eastern ball game. There's a swing and a miss by Troy O'Leary. We'll be on the air Sunday at 1. Tomorrow night, as our pregame guest, we're going to talk to Steve Paris about last September's surgery, the long rehab that has ensued leading up to his start on Sunday. Pitches inside. So we'll talk to Steve tomorrow night. Then he gets the start on Sunday. Been a long time coming. There's a turn and a throw, and back safely is the runner, Guerrero. Troy O'Leary has been retired on a nice play by the Blue Jays shortstop, Chris Woodward. Pitch is fouled off into the seats. He also has had a base hit, walked, and scored a run. One ball and two strikes on Troy O'Leary, the former Boston Red Sox outfield. The Expos came into play 32 and 33, tied for third with the Mets in the National League East. Blue Jays are fourth in the American League East, trying to move up on Baltimore. Here's a pitch on the way, and it misses outside. So it's two balls and two strikes on left hand hitting Troy O'Leary with 
Fernando Tatis waiting on deck. And the Expos ahead six to two here in the sixth inning. Infield set for a double play. The outfield straight away and the pitch is foul back into the screen. Don't forget Mike Wilner up behind us on the post game show. And then tomorrow as part of our expanded free game show. We'll be on at 6.30 Eastern tomorrow night. Runner goes and it's a half swing. Throw it down. Sliding in safely is Guerrero with a stolen base as O'Leary struck out. The throw not quite in time to get Guerrero, who with those long legs and big strides can eat up real estate. So he's in with a stolen base. And for Vladimir, that is stolen base number 12. This guy is the complete package. And now the batter is Tatis. He almost offered it the pitch. It missed. Ball one. I'll tell you, if they do fold the Expos, they'll be waiting in line out to the street trying to get a hold of Vladimir Guerrero. What a talent. Pitches down and in. Ball two, two and zero oh to Fernando Tatis, who has had an RBI single tonight, hit into a fielder's choice, scored on the Lee Stevens two-run homer in the third, flied out to center in the fifth, but has turned in two dazzling plays over at third base. The pitch, Corey Thurman misses away. Ball three, three and zero. Oh. Man in scoring position, Guerrero on his. 12th stolen base. Corey Thurman in the hole, 3 0 here to Fernando Tatis. And the pitch is in for a strike, 3 1. You don't know if maybe you try to waste the pitch right, right there, and if he wants to swing, let him swing, but just try and set it up against the next hitter. But that's Lee Stevens, who's about to knock down some walls here tonight. Swinging and a miss. Three and two now on Tatis. People were grumbling before the game saying Lee Stevens just hasn't done anything for us this year, hitting a buck 88. Well, guess what? Tonight, a bases loaded walk, a two run homer, and an RBI triple. Four ribbies in the ball game. And I mean, he has smoked the ball tonight. He hit one ball in his first at bat, just foul. And it was the longest that he's hit here this evening. Here comes the pitch. Had him out front on the swing, and he struck him out. So that will take care of that, and that will leave Vladimir Guerrero at second base. However, the Blue Jays have work to do as they come up in the seventh. Jerry to tell you about it. The Blue Jays are trailing 6-2 to two to the Expos on Rogers Blue Jays Baseball on the Fan Radio Network. Once again, our thanks to Tom Cheek, former Champlainer, 26-year veteran, play-by-play -play man with the Toronto Blue Jays for taking us through that previous inning. It was a rare opportunity for those of us in the North Country to hear Tom at his new job because obviously very few of us would probably be listening to the Blue Jays on the airways.